Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the annual AFTO Laboratory Science and Technology Committee meeting. Today, we have a wonderful group of speakers. Uh, we actually have three, I'm sorry, four, and I am going to begin by reading all of their bios, and then I will be passing it on to Dr. Katz uh, with OCAC. Let's sit down. So to begin, Dr. Linda Katz is the Director of the Office of Cosmetics and Colors, OCAC, at the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, which regulates cosmetics and certifies colors used in foods, cosmetics, drugs, and devices. In her current role as OCAC Office Director, Dr. Katz is responsible for establishing the strategic plans for OCAC and directly and sorry, directing regulatory and research activities. She also is responsible for liaising with industry, non-governmental organizations, consumers, stakeholder groups, and national and international regulators on policy and research related issues. She is recognized nationally and internationally for cosmetic initiatives involving harmonization, safety, and legislative activities. Dr. Katz received her MD from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine, her MPH in epidemiology from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Dr. Katz will be our first speaker. Next is Mark Abdi. Mark is the Director of Business Process Improvement Staff within FDA's Office of Regulatory Affairs and currently serves as the co-lead for the HP 2030 Norovirus Environmental Contamination Workgroup. Mark has worked in ORA for the last eight years, and prior to that, worked in the Office of the Secretary at HHS, as well as FDA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. He has a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree and PhD in Veterinary Pathology from the University of Georgia. Mark will introduce our CDC speakers. First is Sarah Mirza. Dr. Sarah Mirza is an epidemiologist who has been at CDC for nearly 20 years. She currently serves as a deputy team lead for the epidemiology team and leads for NOAA virus epidemiology programs. In the viral gastroenteritis branch, Division of Viral Disease at the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Disease. Sarah earned her MPH from UCLA in epidemiology and biostatistics, and her PhD in epidemiology from Johns Hopkins University, Bloomberg School of Public Health. She has served in many roles at CDC, gaining significant expertise in establishing and evaluating surveillance systems and program management, both in the United States and globally. She currently leads surveillance efforts and projects to elicit a better understanding of the burden and epidemiology of norovirus disease and to assess the potential health and economic benefits of norovirus vaccination. Next is Dr. Jan Vignier. Dr. Vignier is head of the National Khaleesi Laboratory and director of KhaleesiNet in the Division of Viral Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. Dr. Vignier received his PhD at the University of Utrecht the, Nether the, the <laughs> Netherlands, oh, how funny, I'm sorry. That's where I'm going in August, uh, in the Netherlands. After five years at UNC Chapel Hill, he joined CDC in 2006 as lead of the norovirus team. He has served on program advisory committees from several European research projects and as technical expert on the norovirus subcommittee of a national advisory committee on microbiological criteria for foods. Dr. Vignier has published over 230 peer-reviewed publications and several book chapters. His research interests include all aspects of viro-gastrointestinal disease, including virus detection and characterization and prevention and control of norovirus infections. I would now like to pass the mic over to Dr. Katz. Thank you. Thanks. Let me just go ahead and open up my screen. Okay. 
Okay, let me see if I can. I'm trying to get it onto slideshow presentation. Here we go. All right. Can everyone see my screen now as a slideshow? Yes, perfect. Yep. Okay, good. All right. Um, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me uh, to your lab science and technology committee meeting this year. Um, in the time that I have, what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit about the Modernization of Cosmetic Regulation Act, or MOCRA. Um, I have the disclaimer, um, and I'm not going to spend time on that, so I'll just kind of move along and talk a little bit about FDA's authority for the regulation of cosmetics and colors. And actually, we get our authority from the 1938 Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, or the FD&C Act. Um, the other acts that are pertinent are the 1960 Color Additive Amendment to the Act, the 1966 Fair Packaging and Labeling Act, or FPLA, and now most recently the 2022 Modernization of Cosmetic Regulation Act, also referred to as MOCRA. This slide is really just to orient you for right now where we are. So this is basically describes our current authority over cosmetics prior to MOCRA. And it's as follows, cosmetics must not be adulterated or misbranded, that there are no requirements for FDA approval of cosmetic products or their ingredients, with the exception of color additives. Registration is voluntary, and I highlight that in blue because as of MOCRA and the end of this year, registration is mandatory. Um, and for those of you who may have be aware, we did discontinue our voluntary cosmetic registration program, also known as the VCRP, on March 27th of this year, so that we are no longer accepting um, any registration into that program, either paper or electronically, and that information that had recently been sent will not be processed. In addition, uh, and this is a key point, that FDA's authority over cosmetics is all post-market. The manufacturers are responsible for making sure cosmetics are not harmful under intended conditions of use. And how uh, manufacturers uh, make this assessment and test is entirely left up to them. That testing can be done as cl using clinical studies and vitro trials, or data can be used um, that's already been published for similar products for safety assessments. We do not require animal testing of cosmetic products or ingredients. In addition, cosmetics should be properly labeled as per the FD&C Act and FPLA, and I highlight that as well because that now is changed because MOCRA has some new additional requirements. And the FDA can take enforcement action on cosmetic products shown to be adulterated and or misbranded. So that basically our authority, as you've gathered, um, as a result of MOCRA has changed. And this is the first significant change to cosmetic regulatory law since 1938. That MOCRA gives new authority to the, um, to the FDA under the FD&C Act. And FDA is mandated to promulgate multiple new regulations that I'll describe in uh, several slides later over the next couple of years. The regulations will also be enforceable either one or two plus years, depending on the specific provision. So this slide basically highlights all of the changes found in MOCRA. Um, and I bolded some of those that may be of more relevance or more interest to some of you um, who are listening in right now. I'm not gonna go through all of them in tremendous detail, but I will highlight some of them as I continue on with my talk. Before I get to that, I'd like to show this um, slide because it actually kind of identifies some of the key provisions and when the due dates or statutory due dates um, appear. As you will notice from the dark lines, these are dates that are um, due as of now. Um, the adverse event and serious reporting of uh, adverse event reporting system is due at the end of this year, as are the registration and listing, safety substantiation, um, labeling for professional use, the mandatory recall authority, and records access. The lighter lines are the lines in which the FDA is expected to promulgate um, a proposed rule and regulations, such as for good manufacturing practices, for um, the labeling of fragrance allergens, 
and testing methods for asbestos and talc-containing cosmetic products. Um, that you'll also notice that there's a report on PFAS that is due to Congress, and that basically comes out at the end of 2025. So um, let me start off with the definitions, and I'm not going to read them um, because that you can read uh, in MOCRA itself, but the things I want to highlight is that MOCRA changes somewhat the definition of a cosmetic product, it further defines a facility, it further defines who's the res who is responsible in multiple provisions as the responsible person, and it defines adverse events as well as serious adverse events. And the serious adverse events, I'll go into more detail in a few more slides. So provisions enforceable under MOCRA beginning December 29th, 2023 are safety substantiation, mandatory adverse event reporting, registration and product listing, mandatory recall authority, records access, and labeling for professional use. For safety substantiation, a responsible person is required to ensure and maintain records supporting adequate safety substantiation for their product. Um, it, in the in MOCRA itself, adequate substantiation of safety means test studies or other evidence uh, or information that is considered among experts qualified by scientific training and experience to evaluate the science safety of cosmetic products and their ingredients sufficient to support a reasonable certainty that the product is safe. Safe means that the product and ingredients are not injurious to users under the conditions of use prescribed um, by labeling or under conditions of use as are customary or usual. Again, it does not define or spe specify what the safety testing needs to be other than um, there needs to be adequate substantiation of the safety to support the reasonable certainty that the product is safe. For adverse events, it, um, MOCRA provides a definition of serious adverse events. And I highlight this because it's somewhat different than the definition for, used for serious adverse events for other FDA regulated commodities. For other FDA regulated commodities, adverse events are described as an event, um, an adverse event that results in death a life-threatening experience, inpatient hospitalization, a persistent or significant disability or incapacity, a congenital anomaly or birth defect. Um, but what here Mocha adds in an infection or significant disfigurement, including serious and persistent rashes, second or third degree burns, significant hair loss, or persistent or significant alteration of appearance, other than as intended under conditions of use, that are customary or usual. It further adds in the subclause B um, or requires based on reasonable medical judgment, a medical or surgical intervention to prevent an outcome described in subparagraph A. So a responsible person um, is responsible to submit to the FDA within 15 business days of receiving a serious adverse event report. Any new additional information that's received must be submitted within one year of the initial report. Records for each report are to be retained for six years unless you're a small business and then it goes down to three years. It also authorizes FDA to have access to such records during an inspection. For registration and product listing, it requires the owners or operators of existing facilities to register each facility not later than December 29th, 2023. And that's again, the statutory date. New facilities are to register within 60 days of first manufacturing or processing and registration updates are biannual. It also requires the responsible person to submit product listings, including product ingredients and to provide updates annually. Um, FDA is in the process of developing registration and listing system um, so that uh, these systems will be available um, for the registration. So let me go on then to additional key MOCRA provisions. It also includes mandatory recall authority. And again, this specifies when that can be done. So this is if the FDA determines that there is a reasonable probability that a cosmetic is adulterated or misbranded and the use or exposure to a cosmetic will cause serious adverse health consequences or death, the FDA has the authority to order a mandatory recall 
if the responsible person refuses to do so voluntarily. In addition, it allows records access and it requires documentation and record keeping. Um, this may be, the records may be asked for at a time of inspection, and it amends the FDNC Act to provide that the FDA inspections of facilities that manufacture or process cosmetics shall extend to certain records and information, such as adverse event report information, when applicable standards for records inspection applies. And access, again, it provides for certain conditions are met, that the FDA can access and copy certain records related to a cosmetic product, including safety records. For labeling requirements, um, it states that professional labeling must include the same information required of cosmetic products for consumer use with a statutory date of December 29th, 2023. And it provides for cosmetic product labels um, revisions to include domestic address, phone number, or electronic contact and that statutory due date is December 29th, 2024. It also requires FDA to establish um, certain regulations, such as the good manufacturing practice requirements or GMPs for facilities that manufacture cosmetic products, fragrant al allergen labeling requirements, and standardized testing methods for detecting and identifying asbestos in talc-containing cosmetic products. With regard to good manufacturing practices, it requires FDA to establish GMP regulations consistent to the extent practicable and appropriate with national and international standards to take into account size and scope of business, as well as public health um, risks of cosmetics. And that this may also include records inspections to evaluate compliance with GMPs and to provide some flexibility. The proposed rule is um, has a statutory date of December 29th, 2024, and a final rule has a statutory date of December 29th, 2025. Yesterday, we held a public listening session for GMPs, and we had over um, 2,900 um, registered to listen, with over 92 um, individuals registered to actually make presentations. Um, I've added the bullet at the bottom that there, just so that you're aware, we have a deadline of July 3rd, 2023 to submit comments to the docket. And the docket number is FDA-2023-N-1466. And dash 1466. So if anyone has comments that they wish to submit, please do so by the due date. It also requires um, FDA to um, promulgate fragrance allergen um, regulations and that it um, requires FDA to determine the fragrance allergens and that we have to uh, issue a proposed date rule by June 29th, 2024 as a statutory date. And 180 days later, a final rule after the closure of the comment period. It also requires FDA to promulgate tattoo, talc um, containing regulations and this is to establish test methods for detecting and identifying asbestos and talc containing cosmetic products. A proposed rule on the statutory date before December 29th, 2023. And the final rule no later than 100 days after the closure of the comment period for the proposed rule. And as I mentioned before, it also provides as um, asks for a report on PFAS. Um, and FDA is to publish a report um, to our website by December 29th, 2025. There are certain exemptions to MOCRA um, and that these exemptions include certain small businesses registra uh, certain re from registration, GMPs and product re listing requirements. Such exemptions, however, do not apply to the manufacturer of facilities that manufacture the following cosmetic products. Products that regularly come into the contact with the mucous membrane of the eye under customary or usual conditions of use products that are injected, products that are intended for internal use, and products that are intended to alter the appearance for more than 24 hours under customary or usual conditions of use, and removal by the consumer is not part of such use. There are also exemptions for certain products and facilities that are subject to requirements for drugs and devices. There are also enforcement and conforming amendments and that these new provisions become effective December 29th, 2023. 
Um, there are new general labeling requirements, as I mentioned before, and for the cosmetic labeling to include the contact information such that the responsible person can receive adverse event reports. Um, and this is effective December 29th, 2024. It also provides that the following are prohibited acts under the FDNC Act. Failure to register or submit listing information, refusal or failure to follow a recall order, failure to comply with adverse event reporting requirements. Uh, in addition, cosmetic products that are, adulterate, are adulterated if manufactured under conditions that do not meet GMP regulations or do not have adequate substantiation for safety. For cosmetic products are misbranded if they are not in compliance with labeling requirements. And there are requirements for confidentiality and protection of trade secret or confidential commercial information. So in conclusion, um, as you're all aware, the, there's a global, the cosmetic market is global and the global markets existed for many uh, FDA regulated products at the FDA. However, with a global market, challenges remain for aligning safety testing strategies across multiple jurisdictions. With new authorities come new challenges. I have listed here our website, and we are constantly updating that with regard to MOCRA, and that if you have any questions specifically about MOCRA, you can actually send them to questions about MOCRA at fda.hhs.gov. So I will stop here, and I guess I've allowed some time for questions, and I'll stop sharing my screen. If anybody has any questions for Dr. Katz, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, Dr. Katz, it was a very thorough speech and everybody uh, understood everything. So that's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> All righty. So <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so next on the list is Mark Ab Abdi, and he will be introducing and working with Sarah Mirza and Jan Beignet. Thank you. Thanks, Rochelle. Hi, folks. Uh, this is Mark. Um, so as it was mentioned in the bio, I'm the co-lead of the Environmental Contamination Work Group that sits under AFTO's Healthy People 2030 norovirus work. Um, I'm going to keep it brief on my end. But as such, I get to work with a lot of the scientists that are in the norovirus trenches, as I like to call it. And um, two of them you have speaking you, to you today, and that's um, Sarah Mertz and Jan Vignier. So I'm going to stop talking and hand it over to them, and hopefully you'll all learn a little bit about noro or get a refresher. I'm going on mute. Thanks very much, Mark, um, and thanks for the opportunity to present today. I am just going to make sure I am sharing my screen. Are you able to see my screen? It should be a presentation. Yes, it just popped up. Great. Okay, give me one second. Just for bandwidth issues, I'm going to go ahead and close the video. Um, so as Mark said, um, I'm Sarah Mirza, and I work in CDC's Viral Gastroenteritis Branch, um, along with uh, Dr. Jan Vignier, who runs the Khaleesi Virus Lab. Um, and it's a pleasure to speak to you today a little bit about the norovirus surveillance and detection work that our program does. So I'll start out by talking a little bit about norovirus as a pathogen, give you a little sense of the burden. Um, and some of the work that we've been doing specifically on outbreak surveillance. And then Dr. Vignier will um, share some interesting updates on work that his lab is doing. So I think everyone has probably heard of norovirus. It is certainly responsible for many um, related news headlines, um, especially before the COVID pandemic began and we're seeing more and more. Again, uh, more inf uh, norovirus in the news. Just recently, CDC published a report that um, found that 40% of foodborne outbreaks are associated with food contamination by 
um, ill or infectious workers, many of whom, the great majority, um, are norovirus, because norovirus is indeed the leading cause of acute gastroenteritis. Um, while we often hear about norovirus and its association with cruise ships, um, it's actually, outbreaks can occur anywhere, at food establishments, and long-term care facilities. Um, we often hear of them in schools and daycares, that's a leading setting, and also on cruise ships and really other congregate settings. Um, so, uh, thinking about our overall burden for norovirus, um, what does this really mean for the United States? Well, in the U.S., we find that um, the annual or lifetime risk of your or my getting norovirus um, comes out to about five episodes per person over their lifetime. So we have data from um, different surveys and analyses that our team has done that has shown us that um, while only a small percentage of patients with acute gastroenteritis will seek medical care and submit stools for testing, we can look at um, some of that data and extrapolate out using administrative data sets um, to, to get these estimates. We um, believe there are about 900 deaths per year due to norovirus, and these are mostly in the elderly, and over 100,000 hospitalizations. So annually, there are about 20 million cases of norovirus in the U.S., and um, this is really a very significant burden. Um, a great deal of this in terms of the outpatient clinic visits and, and even the emergency department visits is in the pediatric population. So really a, an important pathogen just in terms of the um, impact it has on productivity. And then just thinking about this globally, um, there's over 684 million estimate uh, illnesses each year. Um, globally, these are associated with acute gastroenteritis, over 200 deaths annually. It really is the leading cause of foodborne illness worldwide, and um, certainly here in the United States in terms of outbreaks. And this costs us about $60 billion um, in societal costs. So that's time lost from work, time lost from school, time spent on child care or care for um, family members that are illness. So it is um, really a, a very impactful virus. Um, so just to reiterate uh, and share with you a little bit of information on the illness, um, the incubation period is quite short, anywhere from 12 hours to 48 hours. Um, it has a very acute onset with um, vomiting and or diarrhea. Vomiting is often a hallmark, um, watery, non-bloody stools. Uh, most folks recover after about 12 to 72 hours. And we find that um, the most severe illness, as I mentioned, is really in young children, the elderly, and the immunocompromised. Um, importantly, 30% of infections are subclinical, which means um, you may be infected and able to transmit, but unaware that you are actually ill. Um, and uh, virus is shed very easily. It's a, it's a key part of the transmission cycle. It's shed in very large quantities in both stool and vomit. The highest level of shedding is generally about four days after exposure, um, which usually corresponds to about the same period that you are symptomatic. Um, you can have anywhere from 100,000 to 100 billion viral copies in each gram of feces, and the infectious dose has been reported to be as low as 18 viral copies. But really, the idea here is that um, norovirus is spread very easily. And while shedding declines over time, most people will shed virus for um, a couple weeks after they recover. So, you know, really, it's those um, anywhere from 48 hours to 72 hours after your symptoms subside, you may still be contagious. So it's important to continue to isolate and take precautions to prevent spreading the illness further. Um, it's a persistent virus. A, a lot of these um, facts that I've shared here on this uh, slide are actually applicable to many of our PCR detectable viruses. But in particular, what's important to know about norovirus um, is that it is really resistant to many disinfectants, to, to heating. You really have to get the temperature up pretty high to kill norovirus. Um, and it is often able to survive freezing, heating, and, and other types of processing. So um, we found outbreaks that have been linked to frozen berries, flash fried clams, and fermented oysters. So it's, it's really important to cook foods thoroughly um, to eliminate the risk of norovirus. 
And um, in terms of transmission, um, as you can imagine, shed virus will contaminate many, many different surfaces. It spreads very easily through direct contact between people. Um, about 80% of norovirus outbreaks really occur from person-to-person -person transmission. Um, it can contaminate water, um, and um, it is certainly something that we have seen contaminated uh, in terms of foods. Also, they can be contaminated by someone who's handled food, prepared food for someone um, while they are sick or symptomatic. Uh, so just Im important uh, thoughts around the contamination and, and just transmission. So at CDC, we do surveillance for, nor for norovirus a, a couple of different ways. Um, we do this really through outbreak investigation data that we get from our state and local level partners. There are a couple of different specific systems. We uh, have the National Outbreak Reporting System that states and local health jurisdictions um, are able to report into, and they do report norovirus outbreaks into NORS. Um, we also have NIRS, which gathers information um, really about the environmental health, so settings of outbreaks. They, they're able to collect a little bit more detail on that. Um, and then molecular data on norovirus, which are incredibly important for strain surveillance, which helps us figure out what strains are um, commonly circulating and whether there's a, a new outbreak strain or um, something to be concerned about in particular, come into the Khaleesi-Net National Norovirus Outbreak Report uh, Network that Dr. Vignet's lab leads. Um, so I will just share one more slide and then I'm going to hand it to Jan to share with you all of the work that his lab is doing. So just as I'd mentioned, NORS is the, the main system, the National Outbreak Reporting System that we use to gather information on norovirus outbreaks, really all foodborne, waterborne, and enteric disease outbreaks. We get information on exposures, transmission mode, demographics, and, and other outcomes. And then Khaleesi-Net um, is a... Um, system that is able, that really conducts laboratory surveillance of outbreak-associated specimens um, and gathers data on genotypes to identify new strains and, and potentially helps us link outbreaks and figure out which strains are most commonly circulating. So I'll stop there and hand it over to um, Jan to uh, share a little bit more information about Khaleesi-Net and the work his lab is doing. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everybody. Um... See how we can organize this the best possible way. Nyan, I think you should be able to just flip your display settings so that you're displaying the PowerPoint because I think it's in the presenter mode right now. There you go. There you go. All right. Sorry, yeah, Zoom is not my default anymore. Um, well, um, good afternoon, everybody. So in the 20 or so minutes that I have, I've selected a couple of uh, topics that I thought would be worthwhile for, uh, for an update. Um, so I will tell you a little bit about the background of norovirus from a virus perspective, uh, where we are for the detection uh, and typing of the virus then how we use those methods. Um, and I will also show you some of the results that are um, already a couple of years in the making, but um, it's, it's an exciting next step to be able to, to, be able to show um, infectivity. And so you can then, with that model as an Android model, and I will explain that in, the, in this presentation, you can measure effectiveness of, for example, sanitizers, um, you can look at neutralizing antibodies will become important if you look for uh, immune responses, which are more becoming more important uh, for a future vaccine. And I will also um, uh, show a couple of those vaccines that are currently in the pipeline to give you an update where um, the targeted interventions are. So first, um, talking about viruses, so always... Uh, uh, show this graph. It's a very simple virus. It's an RNA virus. It means like uh, like for SARS-CoV-2, as we all know, it's a lot of uh, mutations happening. Certainly when the virus replicates uh, or is has a high burden like norovirus. And so 
to be able to detect that, we use uh, reverse transcriptase uh, PCR and then real time. Um, the virus is small, relatively small, has not an envelope, which makes it very persistent, as uh, Dr. Mirza, Sarah mentioned, in the environment. Um, and we know exactly where the regions is where the virus can be blocked for attaching to the cells and probably the neutralization side. So it's all in this very relatively small genome um, where we have a lot of information on for different strains. So we use this basically as our to go to if we find something like a new strain and we try to get the sequence and try to compare if there's anything as far as for uh, could it strain be uh, the next pandemic strain for norovirus. Um, so we always go back to our molecular uh, basis. And, and this is a busy slide and it basically shows you if you look at those two green balloons on the left top corner, the genome group two noroviruses, there are many of those. Um, and then on the right left corner is the genome group ones. Those are the most important viruses that infect in humans. There are in the genome group two, uh, and they're highlighted here in red. There are some porcine viruses that look very close, um, but we and others over the last two or three decades have looked very hard. There is not a zoonotic reservoir. So unlike uh, for the, our bacterial enteric friends, there is not like a particular animal that you uh, would need to include in your control efforts. Um, they are distinct, these porcine viruses, and we have no if uh, there's no data on that any of those viruses can spill over in the human uh, reservoir and cause, for example, outbreaks. All the other uh, bullets here, the genogroups, we have 10 in total, are relatively rare and or they are detected in, in animal species like dogs and, and, and cows and sheep. So Noroviruses is basically in, for human infections is genogroup one and genogroup two, and which are quite genetically different as is shown in this graph. So one of the most important ones that we have seen over the last, uh, I would say two decades is the G24s. The G24s have continued to be making up the majority of the outbreaks, but also sporadic cases. So that's a very important one. And since the beginning of that, uh, we, identified those strains in the mid 1990s, we've seen a certain evolutionary behavior, which mimics for some people is uh, comparable to flu in one end it is, because we see every two or three years, we have seen every two or three years, we have seen a change, uh, replacement from one virus to another virus that will still G24, but we give them uh, names, it's like in the top, like New Orleans that emerged in 2009, and then it was replaced by the Sydney strain in 2012. That's still the strain that we see 11 years later. So something has changed and um, this, is, this is still causing uh, all, you know, all the 50% or so uh, outbreaks. Um, and so we're trying to understand why this strain is so persistent, why there is not immunity in the, in the community, which usually drives a strain to uh, get a mutation and get emerging of a new strain. Um, so it's G24 and it's G24 Sydney that is still what's causing most of the outbreaks. And here at CDC, we receive cruise ship outbreaks. Uh, cruise ship outbreaks, by the way, are just a minority of all norovirus outbreaks, um, about 1% of the total number of outbreaks approximately. Um, and we still see the G24 Sydney in those uh, in those cruise ships outbreaks primarily. So the detection of noroviruses, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is is based on molecular detection. There is this uh, conserved region between the non-structural genes and the structural genes here, very conserved. That's where real-time PCRs have been developed, and they were developed in um, in 2006. And uh, they're still working really well. So that's an essay that uh, we and others also environmental laboratories are using, the food labs are using for the detection of norovirus. And the typing is based on, we use a dual typing system. Uh, this is the genotype. For example, the G24 is determined by this part of the capsid gene. Um, and uh, the polymerase is uh, 
is, is based on uh, the polymerase stepping is based on this part of the gene. So we get like with, for example, with flu, I always compare it with flu. You have H1N1 for noroviruses is G24, Sydney, and then a P16. That's the currently circulating strain. The P16 comes from this polymerase and the G24, Sydney is based on sequences here on, in the capsid gene. So um, to make it all easier for everybody to type viruses, if they have sequences, we have developed a typing tool. And this is publicly available. You can uh, just paste in the sequences here and it will give you exactly the type uh, uh, that exactly the norovirus step that that sequence holds. So this all based on the latest uh, reference uh, strains that we coordinate uh, globally with all the labs that also have typing tools. So this is for everybody to use. Um, this is a graph where we are going with the different methods. You may have heard about multi-enteric pathogen panels like uh, the BioFire, the film array BioFire, but also others. Those are more and more used for clinical diagnostics because um, these panels can also detect other viruses that cause similar symptoms as norovirus. Um, and certainly when you look into the stool samples of children with acute gastroenteritis, those viruses may also cause the same symptoms. So that is increasingly being used, these multi-enteric uh, pathogen panels. For the typing, we have been relying on what we call Sanger sequencing. That is the traditional sequencing has been around for, for a long time. Um, uh, but now, like for many other pathogens, it will it is whole genome sequencing or next generation sequencing where we amplify and sequence the complete genome in noroviruses. It gives us more sensitivity. We can better compare strains. For example, if we have foodborne outbreaks, one in California, one in Rhode Island, the epidemiology points to, for example, contaminated raspberries, then we can give if we do have samples from both of those outbreaks, we can do whole genome sequencing. And if the sequences are more or less identical, then we have additional proof that there is a common source outbreak. And hence we need to look into uh, the batches of raspberries and work with our colleagues at the FDA uh, to see if that is, uh, you know, of recall, uh, recall is needed. So this is more the technical uh, slide, but I just mentioned the Sanger sequencing was, we have been doing that for, for a long time. So we have a huge database of all these sequences. It's still enough to do the typing. The G24 Sydney, for example, there's still sufficient, but increasingly we find that we need to hold genome and at least the whole capsid gene. So this here, what is listed here, we try to amplify the complete genome and, and, and sequence that uh, using uh, Illumina technology. So we use these methods of uh, in our Calicinet network, that is to say uh, national outbreak surveillance network, and we are increasingly also uh, accepting sporadic samples for, for typing. Um, the labs we have trained, um, they, they have an annual training for participants of state and local health departments. And after the training, they, have a, they go through a two-step certification process. They all use standardized protocols for both detection and as well as uh, typing. And we use uh, proficiency panels to make sure that everybody is you know, still uh, at the highest quality. Um, and we have annual user meetings where we exchange you know, problems and challenges and successes. And you can see there is here in green are the states that are collision and certified. There are uh, still 20 states that for a variety of reasons uh, are not certified, but we're trying to capture those states with what we call Collegiate Outbreak Support Centers. Those are the states that you see on this map with the blue star. So this is an overview of all the years that Collegiate has been running. And I'd like to highlight a couple of points. This is a busy slide, but I'm going to highlight a couple of points that are of importance. First, what you see, norovirus is primarily here in the US is a, um, is a winter disease, a winter vomiting disease, as it has been described as early as 1929. But it doesn't mean that there's no outbreaks in the summer. And you can see there are different peaks. If that is meaningful, sometimes it is. Sometimes it is related to... Um, to more successful or less successful getting stool samples because it's all based on the, on the, on the success of getting those stool samples from outbreaks. 
And if you may have uh, teenage kids, then you probably will find out that if we would ask them to, even if they're sick, they would provide a stool sample, the answer will, in most cases, will be no. So it's really challenging to get these uh, stool samples for, for diagnostic purposes. The other thing that you see here is, um, of course, here, our pandemic, when everything closed down, uh, no outbreaks for uh, an, until the next uh, the next year, where you see it's slowly coming back. And this uh, graph has not been updated with the more recent one, but we're now almost back to the pre-pandemic levels. The other thing that you see here is, is this change of these G24s, as I mentioned before. Um, in blue here, the majority is G24 New Orleans. And all of a sudden here, it changes. But the change into these green bars didn't occur overnight. This, the, the first virus was detected more than a year before. And, and, and so you can detect those changes if you carefully look in samples that are outbreaks that are not maybe a majority, but that it is an early warning system for what is uh, going to come. Sometimes it goes with more severity, not always. So we always are really monitoring this, whatever is new to see if that potentially causes a, maybe more outbreak, maybe more severe outbreaks. You see here other points, of other uh, uh, change of this, the latest is the Sydney P16. We see that since 2015, and that is still continue to make up like this 50% of the outbreaks. There are other viruses, other genotypes that are listed here in this right corner here below. Um, they are causing also, but not really the major part. Um, but if you look into kids, then sometimes the other viruses are, uh, are more important. So it's not that we have to completely ignore them. And now I'd like to transition to um, the culture of the viruses. Many people have tried for many years to grow this virus, to propagate. If you can grow a virus, you can measure infectivity. You can measure reduction of infectivity, for example, with uh, control measures such as disinfectants and sanitizers. Um, so this is a study that uh, was published uh, almost 20 years ago that tried all the available cell lines at that point. And the, the, the result was that yeah, these viruses cannot be grown on any of the available cell lines. Uh, a, a 3D a rotating wall vessel that was based on some development of NASA. It's another example that uh, going to the moon is also have some payoff for, for us scientists. Sometimes new technology is, is developed. Um, and uh, although it is successful for, for other uh, apl application, the, we and others tried it to replicate this initial report and we were not able to replicate it. So that was also a no. It also highlighted that you should not rely on a single report in the literature to see, well, that is a new technology and that's great. You always need to have other labs that independently should confirm these new findings to make sure that it's a really something new. And there's another report with the same fate uh, on a certain human B cell line and um, we and others were never able to replicate that. So still very strange, the virus is so infectious as Dr. Mercer indicated, if very few particles can cause disease, and why it, don't we have any cell line that is able to uh, support the growth? So what um, some investigators did, they, they went to back to the drawing board and they thought, well, okay, so if the target cells are the epithelial cells here, they are coming from the stem cell. So trying to isolate those stem cells where they're first done in mice, and trying to keep them alive in vitro, that has always been a real struggle. But that breakthrough came initially uh, from a lab in the Netherlands. They were able to uh, keep these adult stem cells alive and they were you know, not transformed. So they're really natural and they uh, were able to uh, show that they were uh, growing into some kind of a mini grid where all the other cells were also present. So that technology was adapted um, by a group in Baylor, um, and they were working on a rotavirus, a norovirus, and they started to isolate some of those stem cells. They sorted them, and they were able to uh, to show that they were. And here you can see on this in this particular uh, from one cell uh, growing out to a multiple cell. We call them mini guts. And here you see them under the microscope. They contain these these enterocytes that we think is the is the target cell. So. 
this was the model. And now the question is, can we infect it with, with norovirus? And that was successful by this uh, group shown here, shown replications between the black bar here, which is one hour after infection and here the gray, there's a number of uh, genomic copies of the virus that is increasing. You see a lot of different strains here, and then they confirmed that all different methods, methods, including electron microscopy, that indeed the virus could replicate in the system. So we and others got really excited. I sent some of my uh, senior staff members to this lab to learn it, and we adapted it, and we're able to show the same. So we have all, uh, different strains here, and we show replication in all of them. Um, but not all was able to, we were not able to do it in all strain, not all positive norovirus positive samples could we can grow, but uh, we had enough material here to do some initial studies, which I will highlight in the next couple of slides. This were another non-G24, some uh, G21s and G22s and G23s. Uh, we were also were able to find specimens that were showing replication. So now we could apply those. And for example, one of the first questions that we're asked, okay, in and CDC website said, well, you know, for uh, cleaning up norovirus outbreaks, we need to use very high amounts of uh, of bleach, uh, 1,000 ppm, or if you're a public vomiting event, 5,000. Is that really necessary in the, uh, when we measure that in the system? And you can see here that um, even as low as 50 ppm was able to uh, block the replication of human norovirus. And we showed there were two different strains. So we were confident that this is not the super virus that we initially thought it was uh, by using so much uh, uh, chlorine to kill. The caveat and the limitation, of course, this is a clean system. And the virus is usually either in stool matrix or in vomitive matrix. So there is, there's that where you have to overcome as well. So another question that we and others have always been asked, there is seemed the indication that the hand sanitizers, and most of them, they include either 70% ethanol or uh, 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 propanol, and they seem to be not infective as far as for killing norovirus. So we asked the question, but again, using this, this system, and this is the no treatment, you can see as replication happens here. This is the log increase 2.4 compared to one hour after infection. And you see all of these different concentrations, 70% 70, uh, 70 ethanol for five minutes or one minute. Um, none of these treatments were able to affect uh, uh, the infectivity. So this came to us to conclude that at least the active ingredient of the that's in the a lot of the hand sanitizers is not killing human norovirus. That doesn't mean that there are commercial uh, formulations available because it's not only the active ingredient, but also the formulations, usually proprietary, and they may be able to help to kill the virus. But at least it gives us an idea that we need to be a little bit careful when using these hand sanitizers um, and assuming that it also will uh, inactivate or kill human norovirus on our hands. Um, this is maybe a busy slide. I just wanted to show that not all the strains we can replicate. So there were successes here on this on the left side, and this is the input of the amount of virus. And this is this were strains, even with a lot of viruses here on the top, 10 to the eighth particles, um, we were not able to replicate. So there's more going on than we currently know. There are more factors involved. And so this system is just the first level of uh, 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 the first version uh, of, of this system to, uh, to re show replication of human noroviruses. Where there's more to do because we would like to have any positive sample, including on environmental samples, like say food contamination, you would ideally ask the question, or water, you would ask the question, is that virus that we detect here, but usually by uh, PCR, is that actually infectious? More to do. So. All these challenges are listed on this slide. I'm not going to read them to you, but um, so there is this, this um, uh, relatively low success rate if you take norovirus positive stool samples. The other thing is we cannot grow, uh, sorry, we cannot pass the virus in these cell cultures. So we still have to rely on these stool samples, which are not limitless. So that's also a problem that you need to have enough stool sample that you have shown the replication works to be able to continue to do the experiments. Um, so there's still a lot to do. The commercial medium, the cell culture medium is very expensive. 
it is a little bit labor intensive, um, uh, but there are some, also some new developments that the pediatric uh, uh, Android lines, they seem to be more sensitive. So there is uh, continuing to be improvements, uh, technical, technologically uh, improvements in, the, in this field to hopefully come to a more robust uh, cell culture system um, in, the, in the nearby future. So, so now we go to where we are with vaccines and just very briefly. Um, so the vaccines that are currently in the pipeline, um, several are based on virus-like particles. And there are vaccines on the market based on virus-like particles. So basically are, the particles are self-assembly after they are uh, expressed in an expression system. That could be an insect system often used. Um, but also other systems. And so what you do is to clone the capsid gene in, in those uh, expression systems, and you can then express them. And they these proteins then self-assembly in these particles. They look beautifully like the viruses, but they don't contain any nucleic acid. So they're super safe, and, you, and they amount an immune response similar as to the native virus. So they're being used uh, for uh, several of the uh, companies that are working on a norovirus vaccine. And they are listed here. The furthest along is here on the top. There's a company called Hillevax. They have, uh, they're working with the intramuscular injection. They are currently uh, working on trials in children. As Dr. Mercer indicated, the, the, in children is the highest, uh, the highest burden. So they're looking at children and maybe they can include it at some point in, in the future into uh, one of the childhood uh, vaccine uh, schedules. But also in the elderly, where a lot of the burden is in long-term care facilities, they have done some studies in military recruits to show the efficacy of, of this vaccine. So this is the furthest along. Uh, and then there is another interesting one. is the company called VaxArt. They use an oral pill. And I always say, well, they do trials in healthy adults right now. So the oral pill is, I think, more acceptable than a shot. Um, but I think this is this is has some promises. They also work on the same formulation for flu. To the the platform is really focusing on a pill rather on an injection. So we're going to see how the efficacy data will will uh, play out for for this particular vaccine. And then there are a couple of them are in. Um, in preclinical trials. Some of them we know will not go into clinical trials. And there are a couple of companies that are also working on uh, messenger RNA vaccines as we have seen a success for SARS-CoV-2 where that can lead to. So that's also uh, ongoing. So there are challenges for the norovirus vaccines. Of course, what strains do we include? And is that different for adults than for children? Um, do we need to be uh, keep updated with the viral evolution, like for flu? It doesn't seem to be, luckily, it doesn't seem that it's necessary to update it on an annual basis, like for flu. So once the vaccine is shown to be effect effective, then we, we think the vaccine may be, uh, be able to cover uh, 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 and protect uh, people for at least for, for more than one year. Um, Protection against multiple genotypes, of course, because there's so many different viruses, you want to tackle the G24, um, but also the other ones, as I mentioned, that maybe are more prevalent in young children. And of course, we all, as we hear, are listening to my presentation, we all have seen norovirus, maybe not all is symptomatic, uh, but if you have had a symptomatic infection, you probably remember that, but also asymptomatic infection. So what is the role of the prior infection history and how long this protection uh, that is probably more than a year, but yeah, we don't we don't have enough information on this on these topics. So that's still the challenges, and we hope to learn more in these uh, in these vaccine trials. And this is uh, I just wanted to highlight it because I'm just here presenting a lot of the good work that's done in my team and some of the alumni that they sit here. But they're doing all the work, and I'm very proud of them. And uh, of course, we work with many different partners. Uh, we have global colleagues. We have a global pediatric norovirus surveillance system established, um, but also we work with uh, all our collegiate partners and with uh, programs within CDC and also uh, academic partners that are listed here. So thank you very much. And uh, I will be happy to take any questions.
Thank you, Dr. Vignet. If anybody has a question, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, then it sounds like this was a very thorough presentation also, and nobody has any questions. Um, just wanted to let you all know that these presentations will be available on the AFTA website um, shortly hereafter. I would like to thank uh, Drs. Katz, Abdi, Mirza, and Vignet for taking time out of your day to provide all of this wonderful information. Uh, it's always amazing what's out there and uh, trying to get through all of the layers to find the answers. So thank you so much. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Maria Ishida, my co-chair, um, for all of the work that she has done throughout the year to keep our committee going. And also uh, for Jessica, for her assistance, and for Steve Morris, also for his assistance and keeping us in line and getting all of this work done. So does anybody have anything uh, prior to us signing off? Natasha, do you have something for us? Oh, no, no, thank you. Okay. Jessica, I nope. see you're not being muted. No, I was just going to make sure that she didn't need anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, thank you so much for being part of the Laboratory Science and Technology Committee. I wish you all good health and happy Friday. And again, thank you for participating and enjoy your weekend. Signing off. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>